Hi Fiverr Ma, uh, welcome back to another three o'clock read. Um, today we are going to be reading a part of chapter two. Um, so this chapter will be in two parts because it's a little bit bigger than the last one. Um, so yeah, enjoy, get comfy, uh, read along with me if you want to. Not Johnny Trot at all. I never had a mother, nor a father come to that, nor any brothers or sisters, none that I know of anyway. Not that I have ever felt sorry for myself. The truth is that you don't miss what you've never had, but you do wonder. As a small boy growing up in the orphanage in Islington, I often used to try imagine who my mother was and what she looked like, how she dressed, how she spoke. For some reason, I never much bothered about my father. I must have been about nine years old and on the way back from school one day, walking down Tollington Road, when I saw a fine lady passing by in a carriage. The carriage happened to stop right by me. She was dressed in all black and I could see that she had been crying. I don't know why, but I smiled at her and she smiled back. At that moment, I was sure that she was my mother. Then the carriage moved on and she was gone. For months afterwards, I dreamed about her, but as the memory of that moment faded, so did the dream. I had other imaginary mothers, of course. They didn't have to be posh or rich, but I certainly didn't want to believe that my mother might be down on her hands and knees scrubbing someone's doorstep, her nose and hands red and raw with the cold. Above all, my mother had to be beautiful. She couldn't be too old and she couldn't be too young. She mustn't have had children. It was essential to me that I was the only child. And of course, she would have to have fair hair because I had fair hair. It was natural then, I suppose, that within a few days I had quite made up my mind that Countess Kaninsky fitted that bill perfectly. She was fair haired, supremely beautiful and elegant, and the right age to be my mother, and so far as I could tell, childless. So if she was my mother, it followed that I had to be a Russian count or prince. I didn't mind which. The more I thought about it, the more I liked the idea, and the more I daydreamed about it. I would lie awake in my little attic room up on the servants' corridor, where the roof leaked and the water pipes gurgled and groaned, and I'd dream my dream, knowing, of course, that it was probably all nonsense, but believing in it just enough for me to be able to enjoy it all the same. Thinking back, I'm sure it was a silly fantasy, as much as my cat minding duties that made me look forward to much to visiting the Countess's room while she was at rehearsals. I went up there at every possible opportunity, as often as I could manage, without my absence in the lobby being noticed. I was always up and down in the lift, carrying luggage, and each time I'd just slip away for a minute or two and check on Casper. Mr. Freddy noticed, of course, he noticed everything. What have you been up to, lad? He asked me once I came back down. Nothing, I told him with a shrug. Well, one day, he said, maybe that nothing will get you into a whole lot of trouble with Skullface. So you better watch your step. I knew Mr. Freddy wouldn't snitch on me. He wasn't like that. Usually I'd find Casper sitting at the bedroom window watching the barges steaming by on the river, or sometimes he'd be curled up asleep in his chair in the sitting room. Either way, he'd hardly deign to give me a second glance until the food was in his bowl, and until he decided he was ready for it. Those first few days, I felt he was treating me in much the same way as most of the guests who came to the Savoy, with a certain cold disdain. I want I wanted to like him and be liked by him, but he kept his distance. I wanted to stroke him again, but I didn't dare because he made it perfectly clear by the way he looked at me at the, uh, that he didn't want me to. I did dare talk to him, though, probably because he couldn't answer me back. I would crouch beside him 
as he lay in his chair cleaning himself after his meal, and I tell him how my name was not Johnny Drott at all, but Count Nicholas Kardinsky, the Tsar of Russia. It was called Nicholas, I knew that, so I thought the name would do fine for me. I told Caspar that I was in fact the long lost son of the Countess, and that she had come to London to look for me, and that therefore I was to be treated with the greatest respect. Even if he was a prince, and that anyway there wasn't much difference between a prince and a count. He'd listen to me for a while, to my fantastical ramblings, but he'd soon tire of them, break into a great roaring purr, close his eyes and go to sleep. But then, after only a few days, he surprised me by jumping up to sit on my lap after he'd finished his meal. I dared to hope that at last he was beginning to treat me as an equal that he must have believed my story after all, that we might now be friends. So I stroked him. Clearly, I presumed too much. Caspar sank his claws into my knee just to remind me who the prince was, then sprang off my lap and went to the window, where he sat deliberately ignoring me, swishing his tail with quiet satisfaction and watching the barges on the river. I went to stand by him to try and make it up to him. And I love you too, I told him. I said it sarcastically, but even as I was saying it, I knew I really did mean it. He was an ungrateful, supercilious creature and not at all endearing in any way. Yet, despite all of this, I loved him and I wanted him to love me too. There were moments when, if I'm honest, I relished Casper's aristocratic aloofness. Twice a day during my work breaks, I take him out for his walk. We went to the park down by the river, but to get to the park, I had to walk Casper on his lead. From the lift, all the way across the lobby to the front door. I swear that Casper knew perfectly well that everyone was looking at him, admiring him. He certainly knew how to put on the star. Stepping out all high and mighty, like the Prince of Cats he was, his tail waving majestically. Did I feel proud? Mr. Freddy would doff his, tap, uh, his top hat to us as we passed by. There was some mockery in the gesture I knew, but there was something else too. Mr. Freddy knew class when he saw it, and Prince Caspar was class. He left no one in any doubt about that. Even the dogs in the park knew it. One withering look from Casper and any notions they might have had of the prospect of a good cat chase withered away instantly. Tails between their legs, they would bark at us, but only from a safe distance. Casper made it plain that he simply despised them and then he ignored them. It was on a bench in the park one spring day, perhaps six weeks or so later, that Casper first showed me any real affection. He was sitting up on the park bench beside me, basking in the sunshine. When, without even thinking about it, I found myself stroking his head. He looked up to me to let me know it was all fine by him, and then he smiled. I promise you, he smiled. I felt his head pushing into my hand, felt the purr coming over him. His tail was trembling with pleasure. I know it sounds silly, but... At that moment, I felt so happy that I was almost purring myself. I looked into his eyes and for the first time, I could tell that he liked me. That at last he thought of me of his friend. I felt honoured. The next morning, I met the Countess hurrying through the lobby. Ah, Johnny Trot, she said, as I opened the front door for her. I am late for rehearsals. All my life I am late. You will walk with me. I have an important thing I must say to you. It was raining, so I held the umbrella for her as we crossed the Strand and walked up to Covent Garden, past the barrel organ with the monkey who turned the handle and the blind soldier playing his accordion by the fruit stalls. She stopped to pat the Coleman's horse, who was standing between the shafts of his cart, hanging his head in the rain and looking thoroughly miserable and soaked through. The Countess berated the Coleman soundly when he came out of the pub and told him in no certain terms that he should put a blanket on the horse in such weather, that in Russia they treated horses properly. The Coleman was speechless, too stunned and shamefaced to argue. We walked on.
I have much to thank you for, Johnny Trot. Prince Casper is a very happy cat, happy to be in London. And when Casper is happy, I am happy. I sing better when I know Casper is happy. This is true. You know how I know he is happy, because he smiled at me this morning. And this he does not so often. So I know you must be looking after him very well. OK, so that is the end of chapter one. Uh, sorry, the middle part of chapter two, sorry. And the next part um, will be available soon. Thank you for watching Five Mar. Bye.